So this is lecture 15 of ECE 5312. And so what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to build upon what we saw in lecture 14, lecture 13, with respect to, um, um, with respect to essentially type of uh, like you know the type of receiver structures that we can um, employ. So first of all, while, while I'm up here, um, wait, test paper, test paper, um, that. So now I'm focused. Okay. So what happens is we saw a type of receiver structure that's called what will more as a correlator implementation. What we're going to look at in this lecture is something called match filter realization. Ah, match filters. So you might say, how is it matched? And so it really, what it comes down to is the following. We're going to design, what we're going to do is the premise is we receive this noisy signal, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to create a filter that is SNR maximizing. So what we're going to design is a filter that convolves with the receive signal, which will be some transmitted signal plus noise, such that it will increase the signal embedded in noise and leave the noise at bay, or so, some sort of manipulation. We want to widen the gap. And we, what we'll find out is that there is a type of filter that matches to a specific symbol waveform. That's where the name match filter comes from. Okay. So given that, what we're going to do is, suppose we have a signal, a received signal, x of t, and it's equal to some embedded waveform. It could be S1 of t, S2 of t, S3 of t. It could be any S of t. And W is let's say binary waveform, but binary. And W of t is some sort of sample function of a white noise process. So every instant, so let's say we discretize this waveform. Tuk, 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 tuk is going to be essentially some white noise process, means uncorrelated from point to point to point to point. Now, we make this assumption that the receiver has all knowledge of uh, all possible waveforms G of T that can, it can receive. So, we do the following. So the solution is we want to create an LTI filter, linear time invariant filter. And with this LTI filter, what we want to do is we essentially want to craft it such that we ultimately, at the output, we have G naught of T. So this is like enhanced G of T. So if we know some sort of, there's one set of, the, we have an array, we have a set of waveforms. What H of T will do is it will enhance it over the noise that's existing there. So the problem. Most people think, okay, well, I'm going to, like, you know, whenever you look at a typical receiver, it usually has an analog bandpass filter, right? Because you want to sort of exclude everything outside the frequency band of interest, which is your signal. But there's going to be noise still in that. You can't avoid it. So then what happens is, okay, I have noise in band with my signal. I need to create this filter H of T. And what it does is, if I choose the right type of filter, and it's not really a filter, what I'm doing is I'm taking some sort of LTI system and convolving it with noise and signal, and the convolution of the signal and this filter, this system, will create this waveform that will stick out, and the noise convolved against it will hopefully be minimized or at least kept the same. It does not matter. So let's, let's do the following. So what, what I mean by that? So let's switch gears. OK. So what I mean by that? So suppose I have my signal x of t, which is equal to g of t plus w of t. And then I pass it through some sort of system h of t, and it turns out that this will be LTI, that the output is going to be equal to y of t, 
And G naught of T is sort of the post-processed waveform that's embedded in this noise. And there's some noise signal that's also in the process. And what we want to do is, so suppose, so we have something called signal to noise ratio. This is going to be very much related to your probability of error. So signal to noise ratio, SNR, uh, not ration. And what ends up happening is, suppose that we have signal power here, noise power there. It might be OK, right? But what we want to do is we want to create as large an SNR. What does that mean is we want to somehow process the signal plus noise such that the SNR is enhanced, the bigger signal power or the smaller noise power. So the ratio here. If you compare that, it's SNR. So we have SNR pre, and that's SNR post. We want the post SNR to be equal to be greater than the pre SNR, and therefore that makes it more effective in terms of decision making. And you might say, well, how do we do that? Well, the thing is, remember, this is this is if we have an LTI system, we're going to deal with convolutions, and this actually yield some very interesting results, which we'll look at right now. So what we have is, in particular, there's one type of SNR. So you might say, OK, um, the noise is present, and it's very difficult to remove. right? So I'm, instead of removing it, I want to redistribute it. And I want to shape my waveform that's embedded in it such that I maximize the peak signal SNR. So what I want to do is, there's going to be a point in my signal at a sampling instant t. And I want to have the gap between the signal and the noise power to be as wide as possible. That's the goal. So what I, how do I do that? So it's a, it's a, it's a multi-step process. So first thing is, let's define what the peak pulse SNR is. And it's equal to, it's new. Okay? equal to the magnitude squared of g naught of t equals to big T. That's for sampling instant, big T. And in fact, remember what we had before with the correlator receiver structure, right? How did we implement that? Using integrate and dump. And dumping is done every t seconds, symbol period t. Boom, 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 boom. What we want to do here is we have a match filter. We have these embedded time waveforms. That represents symbols every t seconds. So every t seconds, what is the peak pulse SNR value? Boom. And then forget it. Next one. Boom, boom, boom. So we're discretizing. We're making decisions off of every symbol period t. And then because noise is random, we take the expected value of the noise squared in order to find its energy. So what do we do? Step one, so what is convolution of two time domain signals represented in the frequency domain? Multiplication, right? I remember in signals one, or the equivalent of signals one, when I did my undergrad, that was the scary thing, right, is to do the continuous time convolution. Like we, we had these like 8 AM quizzes in that class, and it was like 200 students, and it was frightening like anything. Oh. I can smell fear in the morning. And what happens is the big thing that killed everybody was convolution. So what happens is, what's the workaround? Put everything in the frequency domain. So take your system, H of t, Fourier transform it. So now you have H of f, big H of f. And then take your, your signal, g of t, take the Fourier transform of that guy. Now it's going to be g of f. Multiply the two together, and then take the inverse Fourier transform to get g naught of t, right? So all you have to do is take the product of the frequency responses of uh, h of t and g of t, and then take the inverse Fourier transform to give you the output. Okay? And now what happens is remember what is the definition of the peak pulse SNR? Magnitude squared of g naught of t. So let's plug in what is g naught of t equal to? It's equal to this integral expression. Now, with the noise, this is that relationship. Remember the 
with einstein wiener kinchin relations and the power spectral density. The power spectral density of the output of an LTI system. That's why it's so important to say LTI. One part because we know how the power spectral density of the output will behave if we have a transfer function, h of f, and we have an input power spectral density. So if we say white noise, what's the power spectral density? Nice and flat, right? So the output should be the shape of the transfer function, magnitude squared. That will give us what the output is of that guy. So the output power spectral density. And it turns out that, you know, that mean squared business of the noise. So that's the denominator of the peak pulse SNR. The mean squared uh, average of the uh, noise, what that's going to be equal to is essentially the Fourier inverse Fourier transform of the power spectral density of the output of the system, right? If you feed, no if you feed W of t in, what happens is the output should be the inverse Fourier transform of the power spectral density. So essentially, so, mm, I'm hand waving. I should be drawing because I got this cool pad. Okay, so so remember, so we have an LTI system, right? X of t. And then this is y of t. Okay. So the first thing is we know that looking at this, that g naught of t is equal to g of t convolved uh, arg. This guy is going to be equal to g of t convolved with h of t which is equal to the inverse Fourier transform and should, sorry, I think it should be over the period. Actually, should it? Double check. Otherwise, nope, no, it is infinity. That's true. Because it's, it's going to be limited anyway. So what happens is minus infinity to plus infinity. And then this is going to be equal to what is convolution of frequency domain? I mean, in the time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain. Um, and then you take the inverse Fourier transform of this guy. So he will be equal to e to the mi uh, plus 2jft uh, df. Right. So this guy here does the exact same thing. So this is convolution. So what is the verb for convolution? And it's not to convolute. Convolute means to confuse and to hide and, and you know, like, you know, um, it's convolve. Right? I'm going to convolve this. The number of times I remember, I think I irritated my professor who taught me convolution. I said, well, how do you convolute this? And I forgot. She, she made some sort of wise, 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 wise Alec remark back. So what you would do is you would multiply. And then overall, you would do the inverse Fourier transform of that. Now, with the noise, with the n of t, right, what we want is we, we don't really care. First of all, I'm, over, I'm just maybe jumping a little too fast. So what happens is now, remember the peak pulse SNR, nu, is equal to the magnitude squared of g not of t at big T divided by what? The mean squared average of the noise at the output, right? So this is the mean squared noise, the mean squared average of the noise. So here, this is easy. What you do is you take the magnitude, mean, the magnitude squared of g naught of t, and that's going to be equal to the magnitude squared of this integral expression. We'll come back to this, okay, because we're not going to just leave it in this format. Oh, heavens no. Squared. So what we'll do now is with that SNR, 
Where did I get that from? And it turns out that the SNR in that case is, again, we, we, we have this relationship. So we have H of t. And we know that it's white noise. So power spectral density-wise, so let's say this is, let's say we only input the noise wt, and we get the output n of t. We know that the power spectral density, sw of f, is flat. And it might have some sort of like, you know, constant n naught of n naught over 2 or something like that, right? Okay. So what happens is if this guy here has some sort of frequency response or transfer function, h of f, that the, what we saw is that s n of f is going to be equal to the magnitude squared of this guy. Right? Everyone agree? And then that, in turn, is equal to, right? So, so far, so good. So now, this is actually kind of critical, because if we return back to the definition for nu, what we have is we have the integral Well, it's actually, you might say, well, where did I get that from? Well, remember, so what is E n? What is that guy? This guy is equal to R naught of n. So this guy is the autocorrelation function of the noise at time, in, at time difference 0. And what, how do you get this? How do we go from S n of f to him? Inverse Fourier transform, right? Right? So what ends up happening is now what we've got is we have this expression. So we ne need to, we need to do the, to get, to get to this thing, which is the denominator. So I, again, I overshot. So I, let, let's get rid of this thing. What we want to do is now we have this expression. How do we get R naught from this? It's very easy. We need to take the inverse Fourier transform, right? But evaluate it at tau equals 0. So what you would do is you, you essentially, I'm going to write in red because it's going to get really confusing. You take this guy, S n of f e to the j 2 pi f tau d f, and integrate from minus infinity to infinity, right? <coughs> Bless you. And then what happens is we let tau equal 0. The exponent goes to 1. So it is an integral of the power spectral density. And then, th and so that is equal to this guy here. And so that means, what do we have? Integral from minus infinity to infinity of, like there's n naught over 2 that comes out. And then we have h, magnitude h of f squared df, right? Now, you might wonder, OK, this is a horrible mess, and I'm stuck. Because now I'm thinking, part of, part of it is because I'm kind of hungry because it's dinner time. But the other part is because, you know, this reminds me of my childhood in Montreal. We're going to use another variant of Schwartz's inequality here. What we're going to do is we're going to use Schwartz's inequality in the numerator. It can be shown that in this type of representation, if we take the magnitude squared of an integral expression like this, that in fact we can actually split it up. And then there's this beautiful sort of relationship thing happening between the denominator, numerator, and the math actually simplifies. All right? So how do we do that? OK, so first let me. Ah. So what we're going to do, oops. So what we're going to do is, uh, let, let's, uh, oh, come on. This thing seems dead. OK. So. 
we skipped, we already did step three. So Schwartz's inequality. Ah, oh, Schwartz's smoke meat. So we're going to use this approach. So we have two complex functions, phi 1 of x and phi 2 of x. Again, so this is kind of a useful aside. So it's yet another way of doing Schwartz's inequality. And both bounded. That means if we, do, if we evaluate this across from minus infinity to infinity, the integral of these guys, they will not blow up. Okay, so they're nicely bounded, both of them. Then what this means is that if we have the product of these two functions, we integrate them from minus infinity to infinity, and then we take the output of that, magnitude square it, that this will be less than or equal to the magnitude squared of the first function integrated from minus infinity to infinity times the integral of the magnitude squared of the other function. Beautiful. Let's apply it to on high. And it's, in fact, there's a kind of interesting relationship. Uh, this is equal if phi 1 is equal to some constant phi 2 conjugate of x. Okay? And I think it's that equality that we want to ultimately shoot for. So it turns out that if we apply Schwartz's inequality in this case, we get this. So it's just plug and chug, right? And what we end up doing, so this guy looks familiar, right? This guy, no, nope. this guy, look, ah, that's exactly like the numerator. So that actually ends up canceling out. And so what ends up happening is we have, yep. Ah. Oh, but, 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 okay, that's a good point. So the question is, there's a missing exponent. The reason why I'm repeating is just in case it doesn't catch here, okay? I, I know, this is what the AV person asked me to do, so. But, okay, and the answer is, what happens when you take the magnitude squared of a complex exponent? <laughs> Disappears. That's an excellent point. So you might wonder, where did the exponent go? And the, the answer is, um, if you take the magnitude squared, so you can put on either side, and if you extract it, it just becomes unity. Excellent question. Excellent question. So that simplifies, that simplifies. If we let phi 1 equal phi 2 conjugate and stuff, what we find out is that the, the best possible h to get this equal, this relationship, the max, basically we want that left side to be maximum. So it has to be equal to the right hand side, is when, and this is where h optimal equals this, okay? So the punchline, and, and, and timing couldn't even be better because we're almost done, is the optimal transfer function equal to a constant times the conjugate of the frequency response of the signal waveform, and then you have this complex thing here. How, what does this mean in the time domain? Hmm? Exactly. So we have a delayed, and the other thing, with the conjugate, time flipped. So your optimal filter, your, ultim your optimal system function, the, the h of t, essentially is the desired pulse that you're looking for, flipped and shifted by an entire period t. So how does that look like? Let's, let's actually draw that. So, it will look like this. So suppose I have the waveforms. Let's say this is 0, this is t. So let's say this is a 1. And this is a 0. And so let's say it looks something like this. OK? So this is your uh, g1 of t. And this is your g2 of t. I want to create match filters, the optimal filters for these guys. So what I would do to create the, the H optimal for 1 and H optimal for 2 is the following. I would flip this guy around the axes. So step 1 is now we have 0, sorry, <laughs> no, not 0, bad Alex. 
minus t um, to, let's say that's uh, minus t over 2, and that's 0. And this guy here is going to be minus t over 2 to 0. Then we shift by an amount t. So the end result is the h optimal for 1 and the h optimal for 2 is this and this. And you might say, OK, prove it. And the way you do it is convolve it and then sample at time instant t. What you're going to get, and we have an example in this lecture, which we'll go to right now. So first of all, you might wonder, how do you implement um, the, the optimal filter? And, and so first of all, why is it called matched? Because you're literally taking the symbol waveform and matching it. You're creating your filter, and you're saying, oh, it's got to be exactly like the waveform, flip, shifted by t. So it's, and it's SNR maximizing. You can implement it using a tap delay. But here's, here's the really cool thing. Let's take an example. What happens if you take, let's say, a signal, and I chose rectangular intentionally. This is its match filter. And if I try matching it, it creates a peak at time instant t. So notice, I think what everyone should try doing at home, like an exercise for a student, is now that, and in fact, I think one of the problems that I assigned, so it's posted online, is you have a bunch of these filters, these symbol waveforms, sorry. So you have G1, G2, G3, G4, come up with the match filters and prove that they, in fact, match. And what you will see is when you convolve them, if you convolve the correct match filter to the symbol, there's a peak. It's the highest value at T. When you mismatch, it ain't a peak, and it ain't the largest value. Try it out. Oh, it's like signals one all over again. How many people here like signals one? <laughs> Luckily, the camera only focuses on me. So the, 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 the resounding vote of confidence for signals one actually uh, was, sh was not shown. <laughs> OK. So last slide. So how would, how would you do this? You essentially have some sort of rectangular policy. You would have an integrator in this case. So that's what essentially your, your matching, if you use a, um, a rectangular pulses, would look like. It would look like some sort of integrator. And essentially, when you come up to time instant t, you don't care the tail after that. You just reset, and you wait for the next symbol waveform at the next instant. And then you go bloop, sample, and reset. All right? OK. So, so it, that is. So, th so there's, okay, so that's an excellent question. So is this an optimal receiver or is this one of several? And the answer is, this is one other way of implementing it. So you can either use correlator based, right? So you, and correlation, think about what you're doing. You're multiplying receive signal with a known signal. So you're taking the correlation and you subtract off the energy. Here, what you're doing is you're convolving the signal like let's say a desire, uh, the incoming symbol waveform with one. Uh, so, so the match filter realization is almost exactly like the correlator realization. You have a finger or a branch corresponding to each possible waveform. And then you say, sample at t, who has a max? Sample at 2t, who has a max? Sample at 3t, who has a max? So, it's, so this, all I've done here. Um, well, it's not ML because what happens is our metric is different. What are we trying to maximize? So here, the energy, exactly. As opposed to, like, let's say the correlation, which was with the correlator-based implementation. So excellent question. Okay, so that concludes lecture 15. Now, um, for those of you that were patient, let's see if I can get this going. Okay. Yeah, so...